Hi, I'm uh, David Rollings from the Queensland University of Technology. Um, this is some short training video just to run over, run through our uh, manual sampling techniques that we use. Um, so this is just one of the types of manual chamber that we use. It's quite a simple uh, chamber, relatively cheap. Um, that's quite important when you have um, obviously a lot of chambers, the price comes into it. It's also relatively easy to sample because the lids are quite small. So if you have to walk any distance to put your uh, lids on your chambers, um, it's much easier to carry a uh, lid like this compared to um, another chamber system such as we have behind us. Um, so as I said it comprises of two parts, uh, this is the chamber itself, we, we just etch a line into the chamber that's at 10 centimetres, okay. that gives us 20 centimetres of head space, uh, 20 centimetres um, that sit above the ground, um, both ends are tapered, one end whack into the soil, very easy. Of course it helps if it's uh, quite wet or freshly tilled, um, but these chambers are quite robust um, and they can be hammered into quite uh, uh, heavy soil. The second part is the lid. Um, so we just put this on when we're actually measuring the emissions. Um, it's comprised of uh, two major parts, I suppose. It's basically just a stormwater cap, but we etch a groove in the lid and that's where we get our seal from. We, we line that with rubber. Um, with the lid, we use um, a sampling port with a lure lock on it, a lure lock tap. Um, this allows us to basically open and close that very easily. Uh, before you sample, it's very important to make sure that's all tight, um, that the tap's open. So when, when we put that over our chamber, get a nice form seal, it can equilibrise uh, with the um, pressure in the chamber. Um, we then close that and that's our sampling. Uh, depending on your crop, uh, chamber placement is quite important. Um, if you have uh, banding of fertiliser, it's very important to take into account both the banded areas and the non-banded areas. Um, we typically don't put these chambers over plants unless it's in a pasture, um, simply because the effect that this chamber has on the plants itself is just uh, going to make a very different microenvironment within the chamber. Um, so here I put one basically where we expect our banding to be. Um, this is where the majority of our fertiliser takes um, is accounted for. But then we also have a non-banded area that we need to take into account too. So we put uh, one in both. Uh, wheel tracks are another key thing. Um, in some systems they can actually comprise quite a substantial amount of the, um, the area of the crop. So it's very important to sampling wheel tracks. One issue that we have found um, in wheel tracks, particularly in the heavy black soils like we have here, is that they can actually pond water. So it's very critical that you take, um, you keep an eye on that. If you find that's happening, what you can do is just drill a hole at surface level um, and then just put a bung in there at, when it comes to sample. That allows the water to um, drain away. Um, so when we take this, in, uh, when we uh, calculate our final results, uh, we need to take into account the proportions that each of these uh, different um, uh, land management bits have on the whole field. So the proportion that is affected by the wheel tracks, the proportion that's affected by the, um, the fertiliser band and the, the non-fertilised uh, portion, and that gives us our whole emission for the field. So when we um, design our experimental uh, setup, it's very important to think about uh, first of all, the number of rep replicate chambers we need per um, uh, crop or per uh, uh, treatment. Um, and the other thing is how often we sample those chambers. So typically we want a minimum of six replicates. Um, you could get away with four if you're measuring in both positions. Um, but six is ideal simply because it covers a larger surface area. Um, obviously the bigger the chamber the better, but in this case we're using this size chamber so we recommend, recommend six replicates. Um, as far as sampling regime goes, once again, the more the better. Um, obviously this is going to de uh, be dependent on funds. Um, the analysis itself is quite expensive. 
and for every um, sample you take you have to remember you're taking at least three or four samples. Um, so we recommend a minimum weekly um, after events such as rain events, um, it might depend on the system. If you're in quite a sandy soil where you get a lot of uh, high, fr uh, high frequency but low rainfall events, you know, sample after five, five millimeters or so. Um, if you're in a heavier clay system like this, um, you need to sample uh, for longer periods after rainfall. So for instance, in this case, um, after say 10 millimeters of rainfall, we would sample uh, once. Um, after 20 millimetres of rainfall, we probably sample for uh, every day for three days or so. Um, after big events, you can sample every day for three days and then every second day for another uh, two or three days. Um, also after fertilisation, this is when most of the emissions are going to be lost. Um, so it's very important we do the same sort of thing. So um, every day after fertilisation for two to three days and then every second day for another week or so um, is typically what we recommend. Uh, all this is listed in our guidelines that we developed for the um, uh, filling the research gap program. Um, so uh, this is all available online um, as part of the documentation. It's important to place our chambers um, in the field um, at least a couple of days before we sample just to let any disturbance associated with that inserting of the chamber um, to settle down so we're not uh, creating an artificial flux. Um, when we come to take our sample we use uh, 12 mil exitainers. You can buy these commercially evacuated from the UK However, from our experience, um, they can be very variable in how uh, good the suction in those things in these are. So what we do is we uh, we evacuate ourselves, and that way we can quality control each of the um, the vials. So within each vial, we, we inject uh, 12, uh, 20 mils, so we overpressurize the vials. Um, this is important for storage, so any leakage that happens leaks out rather than leaking, leaking in and diluting the sample. And it also allows us to do uh, multiple samples um, in case we have some issues with the analysis. The labelling is very important. Um, it's very easy to mix up the labels, particularly the, the time stamps. So an easy way to do it is just to get uh, stickers. Um, you can put these into a, a printer and print out the labels for each, for each time. Then you just come along and put them on. Um, we sample four times um, over one hour. You can get away with three times, um, but that's the minimum for uh, decent uh, decent data. Um, if you sample less than that, you're sort of compromising the data. Um, so with our label, we usually put on the date, um, the sampling time. Now this can just be 0, 30, 60, um, or 0, 20, 40, 60, depending on how many samples you take. Um, but it's also a good idea to actually record in a notebook um, the time that you, you exactly do that. You don't have to close it for exactly one hour. You can close it for an hour 20 or um, slightly under an hour, depending on your system. But as long as you write that time down, you can then work out how long they've been closed for. What we're then after is, uh, when we analyze this, we're just after the accumulation of the gases, the greenhouse gases, nitrous oxide, CO, um, methane, and CO2 within the headspace over time. And that um, should give us a linear flux um, if all goes well. So a lot of these uh, sampling campaigns are going to be quite long. Um, these are quite high chambers and they can in some instances have quite an effect on the microclimate within that chamber. So it's very important just to monitor what's going on there. In a cropping system like that, this, um, first of all it's, it's only every three months and it's tilled. Um, in longer systems like pasture you're going to have that uh, problem will uh, be a lot more evident um, over the long period of time. Um, if you see, you start to see major differences. Um, just move the chambers um, to a different position, um, ensuring that you do that at least two to three days before you um, take the next sample. When deciding on your plot layout and um, how many chambers you can sample at any one time, it's important to remember that you have to get to these chambers um, at least three times over the closure time, so three times uh, within 60 minutes. Um, sampling itself only takes one or two minutes, but if you have to walk uh, 50 meters or so between each chamber, um, it can be a bit tight. So it's sort of a, a bit of a juggling act to see how many chambers you can sample at once. Uh, typically we sample about 12 to 15 chambers at any one time. Um, it's then very important to take into account the time of day so you're not sampling them too far apart and there's too much of a change in temperature. So now we're ready to sample our chamber. Um, we have all our vials label. Um, sometimes it's handy to have uh, something like this ready. Um, if you, if you have to walk quite long distances and it is quite tight between chambers, it's often a good idea to put the vials out um, at each chamber prior to sampling just so they're ready to go 
uh, when you're ready to sample. So when we put the lids on, make sure everything's tight, lids open, uh, the tap's open, sorry. Um, we put on the lid. You can hear that gas sampling from there, escaping from there. So our first sample we take is a zero sample. Uh, we take a 25 mil syringe, screw that in there, just pump it two or three times just to make sure that you're getting a nice even representative sample, and then evacuate that to 25, uh, 25 millimeters, close the tap, unscrew that, put the syringe on. Now we've got five mils extra, so we push that out to 20 mils. And then basically we put it into our zero sample, a zero labelled vial. And you should be able to see that when I puncture that vial, the syringe closes 10 mils, so that means it's a good vial. We then overpressurize the remaining 10 mils. And that's sample one done. That's our zero sample done. Okay, so now it's 20 minutes later. Um, it's time for our second sample. So once again, we just screw our our, um, our syringe on, open the tap, just give it a pump three or four times, just to mix the headspace. Extract to 25 mils, put on our syringe, put it down to 20 mils, and into our exitainer. And we repeat that for the remaining two times. Okay, so now it's been one hour, we're ready for our last sample. Um, it's a good idea, just before you take each sample, just to check that your syringe is not blocked. You do that by just popping it in and out. So once again, we take our sample. You don't have to close the tap this time. And that's our sampling done. Now we remove the lid, and that's done. Um, a couple of important things we also need to take into account. Uh, the temperature in the chamber headspace is very important for the calculations of the fluxes, so it's very important to uh, measure that somehow. Um, the other thing is the headspace. So the headspace is basically how high the chamber is um, off the ground, so how much uh, volume is in that chamber. Um, sometimes that can change uh, either throughout the sampling uh, season or um, with, in the case of cracking clay soils, it can swell and shrink. Um, so just, although we have a guide, guide mark there, it's just a good idea just to check how um, high that is and record those measurements. Um, other additional measurements such as soil moisture, um, if you can take them um, either gravimetrically, so just take a sample to 0 to 10 centimetres, make sure it's even throughout the profile, um, put that in an oven, uh, sorry, weigh it, uh, put it in an oven, weigh it again, and you can work out the soil water grabmetrically. Otherwise, um, use a, a logging um, moisture sensor. So once we have our four samples, um, we then send these uh, exitainers away to our, our lab for analysis. Um, alternatively, you can send them, send them to our lab at QUT and we'll analyze them for you. Um, we, will, we also, the results from this will be the four fluxes, uh, the four um, gas concentrations, sorry, uh, and then we'll, we'll calculate um, a flux from, from these four samples and also do some quality control on the data. Okay, so it's also very important um, for various analysis and also modelling purposes that we collect um, some auxiliary data together with our, our greenhouse gas data so we can sort of correlate environmental vari variables uh, with the fluxes that we're seeing. Um, obviously rainfall is a very key driver um, or irrigation intensity um, but also General weather, temperature, um, wind speed, um, whatever you can collect is good, but the minimum is probably rainfall. Yield data is also very important um, because there's no point in uh, introducing a new nitrogen um, fertilization regime if it, it uh, adversely affects the yield of the crops. So whatever yield data you can collect as well is uh, critical for this sort of studies. So another type of chamber we can use is uh, similar to the automatic chambers. 
um, where the frame is separate and it basically uh, sits into the ground about 10 centimetres deep and it sits pretty much flush with the soil level. The advantage of this chamber is that the environmental um, impacts within the chamber are minimised. Um, you can also uh, grow plants in there if you um, desire that. Um, but this, this is the chamber housing, it basically sits on top. Um, creates a seal, with a, there's a seal with some rubber foam just here. Um, it clamps down that holds it onto the base. This is our chamber. The disadvantage of this system is obviously um, it's quite heavy. If you have to carry these long distances, um, it would be quite a pain in the neck. Um, if in this case they could just sit right next to the field, it's okay. Um, the other disadvantage is just the expense. This is a lot more expensive than the PVC chambers. Okay, so these um, these are our automated chambers. They basically work on the same technique. Um, it, the only difference is uh, obviously they open and close um, automatically. Um, this allows us to get eight fluxes per day rather than the usual one per week. Um, so it's very good for high resolution data sets. Um, as I mentioned, soil moisture is a very important thing to measure. Um, this is one way we use it, just a, a soil moisture probe. Um, you can buy these commercially anywhere, either as standalone units um, or that plug into a, a, a logging system. Uh, for each chamber we also measure soil, um, uh, chamber temperature and also soil temperature, um, usually at 10 centimetres. So we're here back at our uh, soils lab now where the samples come back to get analysed. This is our gas chromatograph, it's hooked up to an auto sampler, um, it's running at the moment. Um, this, but this system basically can handle 96 samples at once. Uh, this takes about uh, 24 hours to analyse all 96 samples. Um, it takes a one mil sample from the headspace, uh, injects it into the sample port here, that's then analysed for uh, nitrous oxide via the ECD, the electron capture detector, detector. Um, methane by the FID, flame ionisation detector, and there's a, a PCD in there for CO2. Um, at the same time, we have to be quite rigorous with our standards. Um, this is our uh, bunch of standards that we have here. So we use these to get a, have a known concentration of how much uh, gas is in our samples. Uh, we basically compare the results of these standards with what's in our samples. So we have a range of standards here ranging from uh, just above ambient air up to uh, 5 to 10 ppm. Thank you.